Welcome to the Final Fantasy XIV recap. This is an extensive recap of the main story of Final Fantasy XIV in one place, with some additional content I personally wish to add to this recap. This will contain everything you need to know and don't really need, maybe, before playing Endwalker. I made it so this would uh, hopefully enhance your experience of Endwalker when you play that for yourself. So, what am I going to talk about exactly? First of all, I'm going to tell you about the world Final Fantasy XIV takes place in, Heidelin. I'll explain the setting of the world and some important locations and concepts to know. After that quick recap, I'll go over the story of Final Fantasy XIV 1.0, the one that was horrible and eventually shut down before being reborn into Final Fantasy XIV 2.0, a realm reborn. I'll go over that story next, and then its raid stories, the Crystal Tower and the Coils of Bahamut, and then we'll move, move over to its first expansion, Heavensward. Uh, then I'll briefly talk about the Alexander raid and the Warring Triad storyline. Then I'll recap the events of the next expansion, Stormblood, and that expansion's raid series, Omega, uh, before we finally get to Shadowbringers. In Shadowbringers, I'll talk about the Eden raid story and the Ultimate Weapon storyline. In the end, I'll probably tell you about other content in the game that I haven't really gone into detail about, and I'll just tell you what it will entail so you can experience those events and stories for yourself. Anyway, without further ado, let's start. This is a map of Heidelin. This is not all of it, but it's how much we've charted up to Endwalker. To the west we have the realm of Eorzea. Here is where our journey takes place. To the northeast of Eorzea we have Garlemald. The Guardian Empire have conquered much of the map at the beginning of our story, and now they're on their way to conquer Eorzea. To the far east we have Shirogane and Doma. The Garden Empire has conquered Doma, but we won't go too much into detail about these uh, places just yet. We'll focus on Neorzea for now. Three major city-states exist within Neorzea. We have the bustling commercial hub of Ulda, the forest nation of Gridania, and the marine city-state of Limsa Laminsa. Each state hosts a grand company an economic and military organization tasked with defending the land. Adventurers join these organizations to further their goals and ambitions, while simultaneously helping to keep peace over Eorzea. There are also two other city-states. The reclusive Holy Sea of Ishgard, which has continually been in war with the draconic Dravanian Horde, and Alamigo, a militaristic, once powerful city-state in Eorzea's northeast, which fell to the Garland Empire 20 years ago, during Garlemald's initial invasion. In addition, we have the distant scholarly city of Charlian. They had recently maintained a colony in Dravania, and is deeply involved in the politics and fate of, of Eorzea. Ulda is, as I said, the bustling commercial hub of Eorzea. There is a royal family representing the state, the current being the Sultana Nanamo ul Namo. However, the people who hold the true power in Ulda is a group of the most influential and richest members of society, called the Syndicate. They consist of six members, the most important to take note of is Sultana Nanamo, the raging bull of Alamigo, who fled to Eorzea after Garamald invaded his home. Rauban Alden. He uses his winnings from his career as a gladiator to buy himself a seat on the syndicate. He reinstates and leads the grand company the Immortal Flames with the support of Sultana Nanamo. He is utmost loyal to her and her closest friend. The next member is Lord Lolorito Nanorito, chairman of the Eastern Trading Company. The next member is Teleji Adeleji, 
head of the Mirage Trust, and these other members, which are not so important. The most important to take note of is the ones I mentioned. It is important to note that not every seat on the Syndicate has the best of Eorzea's interest in mind, and care more for how their pocket fares than th the fate of the realm. Limsa Minsa is the bustling port and pirate hideout of Eorzea. It's a talosocracy, and its leader is the Admiral whose name looks like someone mashed their keyboard, Admiral Merlwib Blowiswin. She restricted piracy in Limsa Laminsa to limit privateering against the Garlian Empire, and she also reinstated the Grand Company in the Maelstrom as the primary military of the Talosocracy. Gridania is located in the midst of the Black Shroud. It's a dense forest, also known as Twelve Woods, that serves to filter out those hostile towards the Elementals and those in cooperation with them. Gridania is by far the most unified of the city-states. Its guilds all work in cooperation with each other under the guiding hand of Khan E. Senna. She brought back the Order of the Twin Adder. Ishgard The city-state of Ishgard is located in the highlands of Kurfus. The ruling power there lies with the Holy See of Ishgard and Archbishop Thordon VII. Ishgard was once part of the Eorzean alliance but withdrew their troops after the Empire started their own conquest. This was so they could focus their forces on their own thousand year long war with Dragonkind. Thousands of years ago, the people of the island city of Gug were forced to abandon their home because of a massive cataract that opened in the ocean nearby. They traveled to the continent of Ilsabard and eventually became one of the ancestors of the Garlian people. Before uniting as a nation, the weak Garlian tribes in Ilsabard's temperate and fertile region of Locus Amonas were rejected and mistreated by the other races because of their inability to use magic. They were slowly but surely driven out of their home and forced north into the cold, inhospitable region of Ilsabard, where they gathered to form the Republic of Garmold. Emperor Zolus Oscalvus is currently reigning the mighty Garlian Empire. Once they discovered Ceruleum, they invented the highly advanced technology called Magitech. With this technology, they were virtually unstoppable, and quickly conquered Doma in the Far East and Alamigo in Eorzea. The injustice their people faced in thousands of years ago fuels their hatred for the other realms and is their motivation for their conquest. They also wish to get rid of primal summonings by exterminating the beast tribes that worship these primals. The current emperor is Zalus Zoskalvus. He has many legions fighting for the empire, but the leading ones are the Seventh Legion, led by Niall Van Darnus, also called the White Raven, and its Fourteenth Legion, led by Gaius Van Balsar, also known as the Black Wolf. Either flows almost imperceptibly throughout the planet. Places where it gathers most are typically vivid, particularly in the Black Shroud. The Black Shroud is so rich in either that the sentient, elementally aspected ether beings known as elementals reign over the wood and work with the cooperative Gridanians. It's a form of energy and the source of all magic and life in Hydaelyn. Disruption in the flow of ether is either an indication of an upcoming calamity or the cause of it. Primals are beings of ether that consume the ether around them and destroying the land in the process. Therefore, their existence is a threat to the land. Highland is home to many races. We'll quickly go through all of them just so you know of them. All races have two different clans which differ slightly in appearance and have a little bit of a different history. We have the Hure, not originally from Eorzea, and their clans are Highlanders and Midlanders. They look like normal humans. We have the Lalafels, from the seas south of Eorzea. They look like dwarves, and their clans are plainsfolk and dunesfolk. Then we have the Mikote. They are from Eorzea, but are not native to the region. Their clans are called Seekers of the Sun and Keepers of the Moon. They are basically cat girls and cat boys. 
we have the Rogadin from the seas north of Eorzea. Their clans are Sea Wolves and Hellscar. They're basically just very big and strong men and women. Elizem. They have lived the longest in Eorzea. We have Wildswood Elizem and Duskwhite Elizem. They look like elves, basically. And then we have the Aura from the Far East. Their clans are called Rayan and uh, Exhala. They look like dragon girls and dragon boys. Vera. They are from Southern Authord. Their clans are called Rava and Vina. They are bunny boys and bunny girls. Finally, we have the Hrothgar. They are from Ilsabard. Their clans are called the Lions and the Lost. They are basically lion people. Currently only male Hrothgars have been seen, but females are confirmed to be coming to the game at a later date. The Twelve. The Twelve are a group of pantheons in Eorzea. In ancient times they ruled the land until the wandering tribes came to the realm. They all represent one of the six elements. The Twelve consist of Halone, the Fury. She represents ice and is the goddess of war. Menfina, the lover. She represents ice and is the goddess of love. Taliak, the scholar. He is the god of knowledge and represents water. Nemea, the spinner. She represents water and is the goddess of faith. Limlion, the navigator. She is the goddess of navigation and represents wind. Ashan, the wanderer. He is the god of vagrants and represents wind. Birugat, the Builder. He represents lightning and is god of the arts. Ralgur, the Destroyer. He represents lightning and is god of destruction. Azema, the Warden. He represents fire and is the god of inquiry. Naltal, the Traders. He represents fire and is the god of commons. Nofika, the Matron. She represents earth and is the goddess of abundance. And finally, we have Altik, the Keeper. He is the god of space and time and represents Earth. Umbral and Astral Eras Eosia is said to cycle through prosperous Astral Eras and disastrous Umbral Eras. Eons ago, the land was inhabited by gods and goddesses, which the wandering tribes that settled the land called the Twelve. However, the tribes began fighting with each other and a war tore Eorzea apart. The gods and goddesses vanished, starting the first Umbral Era. Once the chaos from this conflict subsided, and the Spoken were left alone with the ethereal sea separating them from the divine, the earliest civilizations came to Eorzea, marking the dawn of the first Astral Era. There have been six great eras of calamity since the Age of Gods passed into legend and the Age of Man began. Each of the umbral catastrophes has in turn borne the characteristics of one of the six elements. Primals are magical beings of ether, worshipped by the beast tribes as gods, or acons. The primal consumes vast amounts of ether from its surroundings and drains the land out of it. Because of this large amount of ether, normal people can't be around them for too long. However, few people with an ability called the Echo are immune to this. Each beast race has its own primal and plans to use them to its own ends, either to harass the city-states, for self-protection, or to fight the guardians. Due to the nature of their existence, a primal must consume ether from its surroundings, therefore becoming a threat to the world of Hydaelyn. Beast Tribes While monstrous in appearance, beastmen are categorized separately from standard fiends as they display sentient intelligence and self-awareness. They often have a mix of complex emotions, culture, religion, art, philosophy, technology, and an understanding of science. To summon their Akon, they use crystals and ether to summon them as gods in their image. 
as to how the beast tribes learned to summon the primals, well, they learned to do this from the Asians, which is a group we'll come back to eventually. The Allegan Empire. I thought it was important to mention the Allegan Empire because of their relevance to a lot of the plot elements in the story, so I'll just give a brief crash course of this historical empire that reigns during the third astral era. Their technology was so advanced that it's still unmatched to this day. Even the Guardian's magitech is like child's play compared to the elegant technology. The empire fell due to a calamity and has since been in ruins. But there are few remnants of the society left in current day Eorzea. Some notable creations made by the elegants are the Lesser Moon Dalamud, the Crystal Tower, the Ultima Weapon, the Diablo Armament, and Ozzy's Law. Final Fantasy XIV 1.0 Story The story of 1.0 is a bit convoluted at times and the storytelling could definitely be better. However, I've done my best to understand it and retell it in a simple manner. Here's a short timeline of what we'll see in this 1.0 story recap. We have year 1557, the prelude to the story of 1.0, giving a bit more context. Year 1562, this is 10 years before the actual story of 1.0. There is a lot that happens in 1562 in each city-state. This is because when the player character, who I'll be referring to as the adventurer from now on, when they arrive in either of the city-states, they'll be giving visions of the past through the power of the Echo. The Echo worked a lot differently in 1.0 than it does now. Back then it let you interact more with the environment in the memory it was showing you, instead of just observing like it works now. And the big headache that the Warrior of Light usually gets before seeing a memory does not happen in 1.0. There's no screen filter to show that it is a flashback either, that's why past and present melts together seamlessly in 1.0. Anyway, after summarizing the city-state stories that take place in 1562, we'll gloss over a couple of events that happens between that time and 1572, the year the actual story starts. The adventure begins in 1572, and then something I'll like to call the Path of the Twelve arc kicks in, before being completely replaced almost entirely with another arc, which I call Coming of the Seventh Umbral Era. At last we'll look at Dalamud's Descent and Final Fantasy XIV 1.0 Final Moments. I wish to show gameplay footage and some behind the scenes information regarding these moments because I get the feeling it was something very unique to experience for players uh, who were playing at that time and it's kind of something you just had to be there moment for those players. Anyway, let's start. In the year 1557, Garlemald invents Magitech through the discovery of Ceruleum and grows in power. They are now unrivaled in technology and might. His radiance, Zalus Zos Galvus, placed the invasion of Eorzea into the hands of Gaius von Belsar, legatus of the 14th Legion, a man personally responsible for the downfall of four enemy cities to date. On his campaign to Eorzea, Gaius' legion conquers Alamigo with ease. The Charleian colony in Dravania attempt to parley with the Empire, however when these plans fail, they begin evacuating in their home and return to their homeland of all the Charlene. They all do this except for Louisois and Urianger, who founded the secret group called the Circle of Knowing. They decided to intervene in Eorzea's future despite official Charlene policy of non-intervention. Their goal is to use their knowledge to avert the prophecy of a seventh calamity. Nail van Darnes started to investigate Allegan knowledge to solve the problem of subjugating rival nations. After restoring an old Allegan artifact, Nile saw it capable of interacting with the lesser moon Dalamud. 
He wanted the Empire to study the lunar transmitter to recreate the forgotten spell Meteor, said to rip celestial bodies from the heavens and fell them to the world below. The Emperor approved the project, and the artifact was studied in the near eastern Baja Citadel, where the first attempt to summon Dalamud took place. Experiments on the satellite were done by the Guardian, founder of Magitech, Midas Garland. Midas became obsessed with the Meteor project and grew distant to his son, Sid Garland. During his experiments with the satellite at the Baja Citadel, he drew a massive amount of energy from Dalamud and it destroyed the entire city. Efforts were made by the Empire to cover up the event, but the destruction of a major commercial center was too big to hide, and the news of the catastrophe soon spread across Heidelin and became known as the Baja Incident though the details behind the incident remained unknown to those outside the Imperial Command for years. With the loss of Midas and the Lunar Transmitter, Emperor Zalos Saskalvus deemed Dalmud to be too unpredictable to harness, and Project Meteor was scrapped. Van Darnus's 7th Legion was deployed to the east instead of Eorzea, and having the Emperor's favor, Gaius's 14th Legion continues to march towards Eorzea. After the Baja incident, Sid Garland realizes the lengths that Garamald will go to win their war and defects from his homeland in hope of finding a way to prevent the massacre that will ensue. The Guardian's biggest fleet pushed into Mordona before the Eorzean alliances could form a defense. By pushing into Mordona, the Guardians disturbed the Keeper of the Lake, Midgarm's armor. Midgar's armor sent his dragon horde to fight them, and fought the main flagship Agrius himself. After the huge battle, the Great Serpent and the Agarus fell together into Silver Tear Lake, and the Cerulean on board exploded the seal to the Fountain of the Aether which lied below the lake. In Eorzean folklore, Silver Tear is the foundation of water and ether in all of Hydaelyn, and the first point of creation. The explosion killed Midgarm's armor and the blast wave hit all over Eorzea but the larger consequence of this explosion would be seen in the years to come. This battle was the first sighting of what the people of Garlemald and the Orzea thought was a primal. The Empire's failure was absolute. The war effort on the Western Front lay crippled and the seal on Mordona's ether had broken. The natural ether crystals began to shine with power. Before this, summoning primals required so much ether that it was basically impossible to summon them, but now it became relatively common. Within weeks, the beast tribes had summoned their primal gods into nearly every region of Eorzea. With the realm's ether flowing in overabundance, fighting these acons would be a futile gesture, as the beast tribes would simply resummon the fallen primals back to the physical realm. In 1562, in Ulda, a student of Louis Wa named Tancred is investigating the syndicate's likelihood to declare war with Garlemald. Meanwhile, a man named Warburton is with his daughter Asilia watching a parade. He gets caught in an accident when the Gabu on the parade fleet breaks free from his chains, killing him in the process. The girl is taken in by the songstress Flamin to redeem herself for her part in the tragedy, and as Asilia's father was a double agent within the Empire for the Elmegan resistance, Tancred knew Guardian spymasters would come looking for her due to her father's betrayal. Tancred would remain in Asilia's life to watch over her. He also renamed her Minfilia, so none would come looking for her. 
Tancred later learned that this accident was no accident at all, and was set up by some of the high class leader of Ulda so they could be seen as heroes as they saved the day. The syndicate of Ulda were mostly concerned about their own profit and glory more than their people being divided and in conflict. Tancred was concerned that this meant that they would invite a war they could never win against Garnemol. The only way to know their plans was with the intelligence that Warburton had collected, but now that he was dead, there were some who planned for necromancy in order to retrieve this knowledge, as they believed he knew of some impending evil that was even worse than the Garleans. A man named Neil Fresney went to Warburton's casket in order to perform the long forbidden necromancy magic. But as he opened it, the body was nowhere to be found. He was immediately assassinated, presumably by a Garlean spy who had infiltrated the city. When Menphilia learned she possessed the Echo after witnessing a meteor shower in the sky, she could see the memories of her father, and was the only one who knew the truth. She forms an organization called the Path of the Twelve, for others with the gift like her. The Empire had Darnus's 7th Legion join Gaius's 14th Legion in Alamigo, and dispatched Eunice into the Black Shroud to scout the forces of Gridania. The magical barrier formed by the Pajali and their pact with the elementals was broken many times. This led to the Twelve's Woods becoming a hostile place for its inhabitants. Two students of Louisois, Ida and Papalimo, were on a mission to the Twelve's Wood in 1562 as the sole survivors of an airship crash, where they were attacked by a raging treant before being saved by Yi Sumi Yan and some Mughals. Isumi brought the pair back to Gridania, believing them to have been beckoned by the elementals, and they were expected to do something for them. A fact that made Ida begin proclaiming herself and Papalimo as saviors of the wood. Despite their supposed beckoning, the airship crash had invoked the green wrath on the pair, which made it necessary for a cleansing ritual to rid them of it. While they waited for their ritual, Ida and Papalimo went about their original mission, investigating whether Gridania was making preparations to go to war with the Guardian Empire. Ida and Papalimo's investigation led them to rumors that a number of soldiers had fallen victim to the Green Wrath and had been taken by the forest. But the reality was that these soldiers had been scouting Guardian forces, and the rumors were meant to cover for their absence so they wouldn't cause panic among the citizens. Ida and Papalimo would capture one of these missing soldiers, a wood whaler named Dunstan. A boy named Krim had set fire to a holy tree due to believing the forest had taken Dunstan, which enraged the elemental. As a result of this, Dunstan had been afflicted with the green wrath for his role in the burning by the child Krim. With Dunstan in their custody, they confronted Isumi, who confirmed that Gridania was preparing for war. When the cleansing ceremony finally took place, it would be for not only Ida and Papalimo, but also Dunstan and Krim, who had been petrified by the green wrath for his burning of the tree. The ceremony was a success, and all were cleansed of the green wrath. But in the aftermath, a meteor shower occurred, coinciding with the Battle of Silvertear, which Papalimo recognized as sounding of the echo.
Ishtola, a student of Lusua, is on a ship on its way to Limsalaminsta. Sea monsters attack the ship, and out of the sea a giant sea serpent roars over the vessel and back into the sea. Ishtola discusses the sea serpent with the locals at the port, which leads her to the culinarian guild for more clues. She gets a lead on an island called Seal Rock, which is said to possess great treasure. However, it requires a key to enter. Ishtola asks around each guild about the treasure in Seal Rock, and during her investigation, she heard about an unprecedented Sahagin attack on the Minson ships, led by a shadowless man. Discovering that a pirate called Emmerich may know something, Ishtola headed for the Meolvan's Gate, where he was supposed to be hiding from another pirate band called the Sanguine Sirens. She discovered a tablet containing information about the treasure of Seal Rock and was attacked by the Sanguine Sirens who were also after Emmerich. They were engaged in battle and Ishtola pushed them back and forced them to retreat. A Rogadin named Stalman managed to abuse his power as the leading pirate to get the tablet and the key to Seal Rock. And the key was a horn. He killed the Admiral of Limsalaminsa and planned to take over. He expected that the power of Seal Rock's treasure would convince the citizens of Limsa to elect him as Admiral. Ishtola finds out about his plans and confronts him. but they are interrupted by the sudden appearance of a meteor shower in the sky. Suddenly, Travon Shea, an Asian that's been hunting the key and allying with the Sahagin, appears right after the meteor shower. He then takes the key and leaves. As you may have noticed, after the battle at Silvertear, a vision of meteor showers occurred all over the realm. This was another effect of the explosion at Silvertear when the broken seal caused the ether to flow throughout the land uncontrollably and awakened the power in some Eorzeans known as the Echo. After the loss of the Empire's flagship at the Battle of Silvertear, the Empire had to retreat and postpone their invasion. Niall von Darnus had convinced the desperate Emperor to reopen the meteor project once again, as he claimed to have discovered a way to control it. He wanted to call the satellites Dalamud down on Eorzea to stop the primal threat using an ancient elegant transmitter. Though Gaius had been in command of the Western Front until this point, the Emperor began to favor Niall's ruthless and uncompromising methods. After Gaius's 14th legion was ordered to merge with Niles' 7th legion, the tone with the legions shifted radically towards Niles' brutal standards. 
Meanwhile, Gaius would find his own way of dealing with the primal threat. The adventurer arrives in Georgia this year, either in Ulda, Gridania or Limslaminsa. As they arrived in either of the three cities, they would hear the words and in the sky they would see a meteor shower, which awakened the echo within them. They would experience the events that took place in the cities ten years earlier, through seamless flashbacks through the power of the echo. Past and present melded seamlessly, and because of how the echo worked in 1.0, they could interact more with these memories of other people. As the adventurer went on with their journey in their city-state, they would eventually collapse. In Limsa Liminsa, an older Emmerich going by the name of Blackburn now is a walker of the Path of the Twelve, and recognizes that you showed symptoms of being blessed with the Echo. He invites you to the Waking Sands to meet Minfilia. In Gridania, an adult Krim, now known as Hermit of the Wood, fills the role Emmerich does and invites you to the Waking Sands. In Ulda, it is Minfilia herself that invites you. As the adventurer agrees to join the Path of the Twelve, they are tasked to help a group of sylphs who have been dealing with guardian forces entering the Black Shroud. After the adventurer deals with these forces, the sylphs ensure them that even though their homes were almost invaded, they would never resort to summoning their Akon, as the cost would be far greater than falling to the Guardians. They had seen how the members of the Ixali and Amalja tribes had been tempered by their Akons. Because the Guardians had made camp in Silvertear, and most of the crystals used by the beast tribes to summon their Akons were there, the remaining places where these crystals could be found would be fought over among the beast tribes who wished to summon their Akon to protect them against Guardian forces. The adventurer was tasked with dealing with the beast tribes that fought against each other, and although they were pacified and stopped fighting, any chance of reconciliation between them was gone. The sight of a horrific beast scattered the beast tribes before any real progress could be made. The sylphs call this monster an Astian. Gaius made an offer to the city-states. He made it known that the beast tribes would summon these threats to the land and would offer them protection as long as they would eradicate every single one of them and all who possessed the Echo. Hearing of this, Minfilia proposes that the path might be able to make an ally of the beast tribes to fight against the oppression. The adventurer is tasked with speaking with the Amalja and their leader to propose an alliance. Here they meet their Akon, Ifrit. He did not wish for an alliance and tried to temper the adventurers. But they were immune to such effects because of the Echo. Ifrit, noticing this, assumed that the adventurer had already been tempered by another primal. 
They managed to escape the Amalja camp and reported back to Minfilia. She had not considered the possibility of the Echo's blessing being gifted by another primal, and the news made her require some time to think. Minfilia and the adventurer meet a group of Alamegan resistance, who tell them of their plans to sneak into Mordona and steal a guardian airship to drive them out of Alamigo and take back their home. Although Minfilia warned against this, the resistance pursued their plans. Because of this, the adventurer is led to the graveyard of Midgar Zormer and the Agrius, and here they come face to face with Gaius. Gaius takes his leave, and the students of Louisois tell the adventurer to not pursue empty leads, and rather find the one who blessed them with their gift. I'll just briefly explain what happened behind the scenes of the game during this time. The 1.0 launch of the game was a massive bomb, and the previous director of the game was replaced with our current director, our lord and savior Naoki Yoshida-san. He had never worked on a Final Fantasy game before, and had been a developer for the Dragon Quest series. He worked on Dragon Quest X, which was one of Square Enix's other successful MMORPGs. Yoshida-san had a crazy plan brewing for how they could fix Final Fantasy XIV, and little by little, with each update the 1.0 version received, the game would actually be better and more playable and more enjoyable according to old players. But along with these updates, the little dot in the sky that was Hydaelyn's second moon, Dalamud, became bigger and bigger. The students of Louisois' advice lead the adventure to meet Sid Garland and Louisois Levelleur himself. He had arrived in Eorzea to aid in preparations for the coming calamity. 
Though his home city state of Charlene in the northern region of Dravania had been abandoned when peace talks with the empire fell through in 1562, his fellowship had chosen to stay in Eorzea and put their understanding of history and prophecy to the best possible use. Armed with the knowledge of untold generations, Louis Wa provided the Eorzeans with perspective on why the empire seeks to annihilate the primals. It was also during this time that the adventurer would have nightmares. When you logged back in again, you would sometimes be presented with this foreshadowing cutscene. In order to maintain their form in the physical realm, primals must consume copious amount of ether. But this means more than simply exhausting supplies of crystals. Ether is the very breath of life itself, and unchecked consumption by beings such as primals would leave the planet devoid of life, as its essence was drained and the crystals grew dark. Because of the increase in imperial aggression and the adventurer helping solve domestic conflicts, the city-states reissued their historical grand companies to present an unified front against the empire. These grand companies were led by Rauban Alden, the Bull of Alamigo, Merlwib Blowswin, the Admiral of Limsalaminsa, and the Grand Elder Seed Seer Khan Ersena, who returns to Gridania reinstating the Order of the Twin Adder, and calls to reassemble the Eorzean Alliance in the face of the threat from the Garlean Empire. Claiming that there were greater threats to Eorzea than an imperial advance, Louis Wa called upon adventurers to fell the primals and restore the Aether to the land. Rallying members from every Grand Company, he marked Ifrit, Lord of the Inferno, and Primal to the Amalja as the first who should fall. Meanwhile, Vandarn's seventh legion had attacked the city-states to distract them while he was constructing a stronghold in Mordona to hold a lunar transmitter that would control Dalamud. Victory over the primals lasts only as long as it takes to summon them back again. And with the bowl of embers now saturated with either, Ifrit would return far sooner than expected, likely stronger than before. Investigations conducted by the Garland Ironworks soon revealed that the entire realm's ethereal network was in chaos. The flow no longer centered on Silvertail Lake, but on the skies. Dalamud was drawing ether unto itself as it drew closer to the planet. Beasts of the realm were being driven to madness by the changes, and the light of crystals was extinguished as their aspects were drained. Even worse, the ether released when defeating a primal no longer returned to nourish the land, but obeyed the moon's bid to rise. Every summoning only bled the planet further of ether. Sid met with Gaius in a not-so-joyous reunion. 
and was able to figure out that Niall van Darnes had reinstated the meteor project he himself worked on all those years ago. With this knowledge, he warned the city-states of this impending doom. As the Imperials were about to attack an Ixaldi settlement, Garuda was summoned. The adventurer had no choice but to slay her, even knowing that they either would feed Dalamut, rather than return to the land. Further meetings the adventurer had with Niall confirmed Louisois and Gaius' suspicion that he did not wish to summon Dalamud out of his devotion to his emperor and homeland, but that he rather had his own reasons. Gaius did not approve of Niall's plan, as sending Dalamud down on Eorzea was a greater evil than the primals themselves. He wished to interfere with Niall's plans, but was unwilling to resort to treason. To this end, he let the adventurer break in the Imperial stronghold in Mordona and destroy the transmitter. As the adventurer was closing in on the transmitter, they encountered Vandarnas. The aether around him was as red as Dalamud, and the fortress burst into flames. The transmitter was luckily destroyed, however, Darnas stood amongst the blaze and vowed that he would sacrifice both body and soul to bring about Dalamud's return. The destruction of the lunar transmitter was a bittersweet victory. Niall van Darnes had deceived both Eorzea and the Empire alike, and Dalamud was never meant as a means to advance the Meteor Project, but the Meteor Project was means to bring about Dalamud's return. Even though the transmitter was destroyed, Niall's claim that he could control Dalamud could not be ignored. The Alliance, strengthened by their first and victorious attack against the Empire, rallied people all over the realm. Mandarnas ascended on a group of floating islands and would complete his pull of Dalamud uninterrupted from there. With the help of Urianger, they found this location and Sid, having felt immense guilt of his part in the Baja incident and research of Dalamud, felt this was the only way to redeem himself of the past. He offered his airship, the Enterprise, as a vessel that would bring the adventurer to the White Raven. Dalamud was now closer than ever. The lesser moon's white electrical lines were visible to the naked eye, and doomed seemed imminent. The adventurer, with the help of Sid, confronted Vandarnes, and he spoke as if the moon was a deity. Vandarnes was now powered up by Dalamud, and grew stronger than ever. The adventurer fought Vandarnes in this ultimate form in a battle that 1.0 players claim was the hardest in the original game's release.
As they defeated him in battle, he fell to the ground, and his essence floated into Dalamud. The floating islands started to collapse, and with the help of Sid and his airship, the adventurer was able to escape. They had thought themselves victorious. Surely killing Van Darnus meant they had also stopped Dolomus' descent. The day went to the Alliance, but as they returned to Gridania and shared over their victory, Louisois confirmed their worst fear. Van Darnus' death had not stopped Dalamut's descent. Their only hope now was his own last resort. Louisois sent the adventurer on a pilgrimage across Eorzea and bid them to pray to each of the twelve in hopes of summoning them, just like the beast tribes summoned their own gods, but on a far bigger scale. This was their last hope of stopping the meteor. During this pilgrimage, the adventurer met Gaius one last time, who implored them to save their realm. Only so he would have something to conquer in the years to come. He also informed them that the last forces of the Seventh Legion was gathering at Cartanaw in preparation of a desperate last attack against the Alliance.
All over the realm, a haunting version of Answers replaced the overworld music, so all you heard was the eerie song and thunderclaps from the skies. Eorzea's ethereal balance was out of control. All over Eorzea, players met up and realized that this was in fact happening. Dalamud is going to fall. The only question remained was, what will happen after that? A void scent called Atomos starts appearing in certain places in Eorzea and consumes the ether of the Aetherite crystals, making them unusable. In the final patch for the game, patch 1.23b, the developers clearly had fun with this patch, as Ulda was overrun by monsters, some mobs were very clearly copy-pasted in a bunch in the city. The Calamity saw the Final Fantasy XIV community working together, as players would have to get on their gabu mounts and form a wall in front of Uldas gates to protect it from the monsters. Of course, this didn't actually work, but the community coming together like this made this event known as the Great Gabu Wall. The Alliance and the Adventurer rode out to meet their foe, with Luiswa at the front lines, and with Dalmud descending down on the realm as they fought to the death and to protect their home and those who lived in it. And then suddenly... Calamity struck. As the 7th Legion was ordered to defend their position to the death, and not knowing their leader's true intentions, they fought not knowing that victory would bring them death as assuredly as defeat. Amidst the carnage of battle and falling meteors, the 7th Umbral Era had begun. The people of Eorzea could only watch in horror as pieces of the satellite fell and rained down on the land, wreaking havoc.
Adventurers plied their blade until their lungs burned, chanted spells until they grew hoarse. They fought without regard for their own lives, thinking only of saving others. Over them, the moon's skin of stone and steel disintegrated to reveal an elder primal, free of his ancient prison. Bahamut had awoken. Prayers of a thousand thousand souls beseeching the twelve for only one thing, salvation. The wrath of Bahamut was so great, even the Twelve's power could not contain him, and he begins to unleash his ultimate attack on the realm. Luis Wa could not let the adventurers die here, so he summoned what was left of his strength and sent them into an ethereal rift. There they would remain, untouched by the passing of the seasons, until it was safe to return. To a realm reborn.